Hello, everybody. How's it going? Ben Gothard here with Project Egg, and today we have a very, very special guest with us. As most of you know, we, we've asked Ben Gay III to come on and do this workshop about public speaking. Now, his training materials, including the Closer Series and the Sales Closing Power Books, are synonymous with professional selling. And as such, he also has a wide variety of expertise when it comes to public speaking. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Ben. He was the number one salesperson at Macy's Atlanta. He worked continuously as a commissioned salesman since 14 years old. Number one salesman in every organization that he has been a part of. He was trained by Dr. Napoleon Hill, Earl Nightingale, Zig Ziglar, and many, many others, and then went along to work alongside them and actually became the president of the company that they were a part of. So it is with the utmost of pleasure and an esteemed honor to welcome Ben Gay III. How you doing today, Ben? I'm pretty good, Ben. I love a guy named Ben, so uh, we'll get along just fine. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Ben, um, you know, I do want to thank you so much for coming on to this workshop today. And we're going to be talking about the secret to public speaking of which you have an, um, an, an exorbitant amount of knowledge on. But before we go into the actual technical details and, and before we we wow the audience, I want to just talk a little bit about your history, about your background. So can you please share with us your story and how you got to where you are today? Well, first of all, I'm looking at the monitor and I want to apologize for what appears to be a mess. This is my working office. This is not where we impress people. It's where I write books and do uh, interviews and so on. And at looking at the background, I think maybe it needs a little work. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, but it's, I'm comfortable here. The, uh, I got, so you mentioned 14. I got started mowing lawns at 14, which every kid does. The little difference was I was in Atlanta in the summer. And with the humidity, I quickly figured out I didn't want to be mowing lawns in Atlanta in the summer. So I went to my father and said, I appreciated the loan of the lawnmower, but I was dropping out of the business. And uh, he said, no, no, you're not. <laughs> but, but let me give you a, some ideas. So what he gave me the idea to do was go door to door and sign up um, customers, uh, tell them what I would do and so on, and have a little unique twist. No set price. When we're done, you pay us what you think it's worth. And I said, well, that still leaves me in the lawn mowing business. He said, no, no, no. Your friends aren't smart enough to do that. So you do that part. Then they mow the lawn. Then you go back, inspect and collect. And you give them half the money. I said, well, there won't be any money left. He said, you're going to be very surprised how much people will pay you when it's left to them to decide what the job's worth, assuming you do a good job. So sure enough, rather quickly, I was collecting two, three, sometimes four times more money than I would have ever asked for, splitting it with my friends. They were making at least what they would have made if they'd had the courage to go get the jobs. They didn't. And sometimes two and three times uh, what they would have gotten under any circumstances. So eventually, after a summer or two in the growing season, I would have 20, 25 kids working for me. And we were mowing virtually every lawn in, in a, I've never figured it out, but probably in a five square block area in, in Atlanta. And I was making as much or more money than some of the grown men in our neighborhood. We lived in a nice neighborhood, but I, my dad would sit down with me and we'd add up the, the money. And it was rather astounding. So I was hooked on, A, not doing physical labor, uh, and B, working at, on a commission as a salesman. I had already won, you know, a, a bicycle selling saltwater taffy or Krispy Kreme donuts and stuff in fundraisers. But as far as cash in my pocket, other than turning in bottles, cans and coat hangers to the local vendors for a penny a piece or whatever it was in those days, this was the first time I thought, oh, you can make money selling and talking. You don't have to dig ditches. So I was off and running and uh, 
uh, I did some of the stuff everybody does. I was a food broker for a while. I was a manufacturer's rep traveling the southeastern United States. I was the youngest buyer at Macy's. Um, and then uh, September 15th, 1965, Wednesday at noon, I answered a little ad in the Atlanta Journal Constitution said, if you want, if you know anything about marketing plans and want to make more money, uh, dial this number. Well, I didn't know what a marketing plan was, but I need to make more money. So I went into a phone booth outside of a grocery store that Jimmy Rucker, the greatest salesman I ever worked with, James H. Rucker Jr., he worked for my father too. We were working the store and I began interviewing this guy over the phone about whether I would uh, bless him with my appearance. And about four or five minutes into my uh, Thing. I'm Ben Gay with Brown Gay Food Brokerage Company, et cetera. But I didn't mention that the Gay and Brown Gay Food Brokerage wasn't me. It was my father. I was just a retail detail clerk. Four or five minutes in, the gentleman I was talking to, Bill Dempsey, God rest his soul, said, Mr. Gay, where are you right now? And I said, well, I'm standing in front of the Colonial Store on uh, Peachtree Street in Atlanta. He said, well, I'm at West Peachtree Street, about three or four blocks from where you're standing. You have, I think he gave me 10 minutes. You have 10 minutes to be standing in front of my desk or don't ever dial this number again. And I said, what? He said, he said, I am not the man standing in a phone booth answering want ads. Goodbye and hung up the phone. Rucker pulled around right about then. I jumped in the car like Robin and Batman. And I said, quick, 1447 West Peachtree Street. So we <laughs> made, a U, made a U-turn, raced down, zipped into the parking lot. And just in time, we were standing in front of Bill Dempsey's desk for the interview. Turned out it was an opportunity meeting. And one other person uh, had answered the same ad. So I ended up being a gentleman. I said, hi, my name's Ben Gay. What's yours? And he laughed. He said, Ben Gay, what a funny name. I said, what's your name? He said, Zig Ziglar. And I said, your name is Zig Ziglar and you're laughing at my name? You got to be kidding. Well, <laughs> Zig, was, Zig was 18 years older than I was. He was in the Navy the day I was born, but he'd never hit it big yet. He was a cookware salesman from Columbia, South Carolina, also looking for his first break. So we started out together and uh, that same day. And uh, off we went. A couple of years later, uh, Bill Dempsey gave me a copy of Think and Grow Rich by D D Dr. Uh, Napoleon Hill. I uh, said, you probably ought to read this. Keep in mind, I'm 22, 23 years old, standing there in a cheap suit or sport coat, cheap sport coat and slacks. And he gave me a record. And it's that bookcase right behind me. You see a plaque on the second shelf down right over to the right uh, if I were facing the shelf is the record he gave me, The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale, back when it was sold on a record. And uh, he said, listen to this. And people have asked me over the years, well, did that work? Well, it apparently did, because two years later, I was president of the company, Dr. Hill was working for me, and Earl Nightingale was the voice of the company working for me. Um, all from that rather quick start, and what I learned about public speaking and, and so on. So it was Wednesday, September 15th, 1965 was the beginning of what most people would think of as the Ben Gay story. But I've been at it uh, literally since I was 14 and winning pro uh, fundraising contests before that. Wow, that is incredible. That is truly incredible. So, you know, with all your wealth of knowledge and experience and training, um, what truly is the secret to public speaking? Well, first of all, you have to understand the importance of it. I was out in California after I joined the company and uh, was rising up in the ranks. And we were out there to, to become instructors for the company, Zig and I and about 10 other people. And I've left my manual behind uh, in the training room we'd been in that morning. So I went from where we were practicing our scripts back to get the manual. And I walked in behind uh, two gentlemen. One was the owner of the company, William Penn Patrick, and the other was Fred Pape. He was the president at that time. Came in behind him and they didn't see or hear me. And they were looking into a, a cabinet that had a video monitor in it. And I heard my voice. They were looking at me uh, giving a talk that morning. And uh, Fred Pape, president of the company, said, he's good. And Bill said, Bill Patrick, 
said, he said, Fred, I will pay more for the ability to effectively communicate than any other skill. So I did the moonwalk back out of the office. They never knew I was there. Went down to the room we were practicing in. Bill Dempsey, the guy who recruited me in business, was there. And he, he says, where have you been? I said, I've been getting serious. Let's learn this script. And I went to work with a fever. I learned word for word a 47-minute script that you would give once or twice a day. And uh, I was, again, off and running. But that was how I learned that public speaking, the ability to effectively communicate, was very, very important. I, I was voted wittiest in my high school class, and I was always the life of the party and so on. So I was one of those people who believed you could just skate through life, like Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, skate through life with a handshake and shine shoes. I didn't know that it was a skill that you had to learn it and you had to get good at it. But I was hooked the night I graduated from, uh, from high school in Atlanta, Murphy High School, class of 1960, when the teacher, English teacher took a liking to me. And the first time she met me, I was sort of, I'd been thrown out of that school a couple of years before, went to private school, got thrown out of there and I had to go back to finish at Murphy. And she knew of my reputation, but somehow liked me. And so when I met her that first day, she says, uh, I came into the class late and got a big laugh. Everybody thought I did it to be funny. It was because I didn't know where the class was. And she looked up from her desk and said, Mr. Gay, I presume. Her name was uh, Edith Griffin, Griffin, and she was feared. And I thought, oh, my God, she knows my name. And she took a chair, spun it around, one of those chairs with a built-in desk, spun it around, put it right beside her desk. And she said, you're going to sit here all year long. And you're going to win the state writing championship. And you're going to speak at graduation. Well, having never been to a high school graduation, I thought she's nuts because that means you're the valedictorian or the salutatorian, and there was no remote chance of me being either one of those. So uh, I nodded because I was afraid of her, sat down. Well, a few months later, I won the state writing championship, thanks to her. And in June of that year, or maybe late May, I stood in front of three, it turned out I didn't know there was a third speaker, the person who gives the prayer. So she had the power to have me write the prayer, memorize it, learn how to be a, I must have practiced it a hundred times in the school cafeteria, just me, the valedictorian and the salutatorian, getting ready. And at the Atlanta Municipal Auditorium, I think it's gone now, I walked down the steps from, with my classmates, down the steps, stood in front of roughly 3,000 people and gave the get up gesture. And 3,000 people stood up because I did that. And I remember thinking, whoa, this is interesting. I'd never felt that kind of power before. So I got through the prayer, did a good job with it, and sat down. And then it was September 15th before that opportunity arose again when I started giving meetings on a regular basis and so on. But I noticed that all the people who were at the front of the room talking made the most money, had the nicest cars, nicest suits, that there was some tie-in there. And so, and then, and then uh, I didn't know you could make money as a public speaker. One day I did a sales training for the organization in Atlanta and uh, I worked six or seven hours. Zig came in and did an hour and he did his, you know, biscuits, fleas, and pump panels, his standard stories, when they sales train, but it was funny and everybody loved it. And then as we're getting ready to go, I'm standing at the front of the room and I look in the back of the room and Bill Dempsey has reached into his suit coat pocket and pulled out an envelope and gave it to Zig, who nodded and put it in his pocket. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. You know, I knew the business. I knew what was going on. If you got a commission check, it came in the mail from San Rafael, California, not out of Bill Dempsey's pocket. So I thought that's interesting. So on the way, I followed Zig down the hall. There was a little coffee shop right before he left the building. And I said, Zig, uh, let me buy you a cup of coffee. And he said, well, I'd like that. So we go in, we sit down. And I said, just to keep Bill Dempsey honest, how much did he pay you? And praying there was a check involved, because if not, I was going to look really stupid. And Zig pulled out the envelope. And he said, well, let's see. And they ripped it open. He said, $300. What did he pay you? And I said, the same. And the truth is he hadn't paid me anything. I'd never seen a speaker paid before in my life. 
But then I said, I've told people that was my last free speech. It really wasn't. But it was that moment I decided uh, above and beyond just selling, we were selling cosmetic distributorships, above and beyond just selling a product or a service, there was a way to go to the front of the room and get paid for it. And back then, $300, Earl Nightingale was only getting $500. Uh, back then, $300, which would be about $3,000 a day. Earl was getting about $5,000 in today's money, uh, was not insignificant. So I decided right then, I, I don't know how, I don't know how the game is played, but I'm going to be a professional speaker. That is incredible. That is incredible. And so from when you decided that and when you made that conscious decision, um, what steps did you take to really unlock the the secret you know what what steps did you take to to better your skills and how did you how did you move forward from there well uh, i started getting in front of every group i possibly could get in front of and in, in the business we were in that was sort of easy i could i had to remember to go recruit people and do my job because i could have spent the day all day every day talking to some group of people who wanted to learn how to sell or or whatever so I had to sort of temper myself, but I started getting in front of groups. Zig said Ben Gay would, would Ben Gay would work a traffic accident, and I said, "Well, depends on how many people had gathered around." <laughs> but you're probably you're probably right. And Zig gave me good advice. He some funny and some really profound. But one of them was Ben, get up in front of them, get up in front of them. Service clubs always need speakers, you know, Kiwanis, Lions, whatever. They have somebody whose job, he's the vice president in charge of finding speakers. Uh, they don't pay anything, uh, but he said, there's somebody who wants you to hear and you need to get up in front of a group, get up in front of groups, practice your skills, tell a joke, do something that, you know, that'll work. And I turned out, I, I'm a good storyteller, but I've never been a good joke teller, you know, two guys walk into a bar type thing. I don't do that well, but I tell good stories and I pay, I pay attention. I take notes. So I have a, uh, I'm sure like Hal Holbrook who does Mark Twain. He has nine and a half hours of Mark Twain material memorized in his head. He tells one opening story. It's always the same. And he uses that to take the temperature of the audience. And based on their reaction to that, he reaches into his nine and a half hour inventory and pulls out the next story. And based on that reaction, he pulls out the next and so on. His show only lasts about two hours, including an intermission. So he works for less than two hours from nine and a half hours of material. So that's sort of what I've done. I've built the story inventory and then worked. And Zig said, you always got to have a a good opening. I said, well, I've heard you, you talk and you change your opening. He said, well, that's because I'm talking to the same groups all the time. And I, I can't, you know, say uh, biscuits, uh, the pump handle story. So I can't just do that every time as the opening. So I've got to have others. He said, but you don't have that problem. I said, why is that? He said, because your name. Work on that. So if you ever attend one of my seminars, and I hope that's coming right up, uh, when I walk on stage, I have an official introduction that usually, if it's delivered well, brings them to their feet. And as soon as they quiet down, I say, let's get this Ben Gay thing out of the way. And they always crack up. But based on how much they crack up, it determines where I go from there. So that's the opening. But I, I did that lots and lots and lots of times. Uh, you know, you when you're first starting out, you're not logging things. So I can't tell you how many free talks I gave, uh, but I'm guessing two or three hundred free talks uh, until I finally got pretty good. And then spontaneously, people started coming up to me and saying, I run a company. Is there any chance you come over and do that for us? So I then I remembered Zig getting his three hundred dollar check and I started saying, yeah, sure. $300. I think that's about where I started. I said, well, okay, that's reasonable. And all of a sudden I was Ben Gay, the speaker. So among the things your listeners, viewers are going to want to know is how do you get started? This is my business card. It says clearly on it, and this is for now, not me starting out and speaking, but it's important. It says salesman, speaker, sales trainer, consultant. One of the first things your folks should do is if, if they want to become a public speaker is get a card that says that's what they do. 
and set a rate. You know, when they ask you, would you come speak to my group? That's not the time to start deciding what you charge. You are a public speaker. Your card says you are one and you charge. I'll just pick a number out of the air, $500 plus expenses, but most of the initial ones will be right down the street or the other side of town. They're not going to be flying you to Paris in the beginning. So you decide what you are, print it up, set a fee, and you have an answer. It's your elevator presentation. I'd love to come talk to your group. My spe specialties are this, this, this. It's $500. And by the way, I charge $9,500 to give a talk, whether it's an hour or all day. And the reason it's 9500 is I don't have to say the word dollars. 9500 is self-explanatory. I don't have to say $10,000 or $9,000. It's 9500 So it's one of those old-fashioned things in selling that's true. As many times as you can avoid saying the word dollars, that's good. So if you're going to say 500 you might want to say 495 or something. So again, so you're not sort of prompted to say the word dollars. And I've just made myself available. And then referrals everywhere I've ever talked. I mentioned the fact that I do this uh, for a living, but I still sell. I all I was selling this morning before you and I got on the, on the uh, computer together. Uh, I sell all day, every day, whether I'm selling because I walked in, sat down and started calling or whether I'm responding. If I'm writing a book, my trusty cell phone is right there. I have the bell turned off now, but my trusty cell phone is right there. And if I'm writing and the phone rings, I always take the first call. We have other people in the call center who can also take them. But if I'm available, I'm the lead caller always. I want to talk to them because I'm good at upgrading. Uh, and I'm also good at listening to what they have to say and honing our own skills. I learn I'll, every day. I can't say from every call, but every day I learn something that I hadn't thought of before or got reminded of, which is funny. I've been at this 52 years at a high level. So you'd think I pretty much know it all. Uh, and I've written lots of it down in my various books and so on, but I still learn new things. I could probably write a book next month, January, just sit down, devote some time, write a whole book about the things I've learned since I wrote the Closer series and Sales Closing Power, J. Douglas Edwards' famous book that I wrote for him after he died. Uh, the, and there's another one, by the way, who taught me how to sell and was working for me in less than two years. He was one of the top trainers with the company I was running. So it's just exposure, exposure, get out, practice, work a traffic accident. <laughs> if that's the only way you can get to do a group, don't worry about getting paid in the beginning. A, you're probably not worth it yet. And B, they will tell you when you're ready, when there's more coming at you than you can handle, you know, off the, off the cuff uh, for free, then you're, you're probably ready. That's amazing. That's amazing. So we have our opening, right? That's important to get down. We have our business card. We have our rate. We're listening to, to the people and making sure we understand what their needs are. Um, we're going out and we're getting referrals from a lot of people. We're not charging at first until we literally don't have enough time to do it. And then we can start charging that fixed rate. Um, but let's tackle, let's tackle the meat and potatoes. Let's tackle the real heart of it. And, and I think that that is overcoming the fear because if I'm correct and, you know, please correct me if I'm not, uh, but public speaking is one of the biggest fears on the planet. How do you overcome that fear and then not only overcome it, but how do you master it? How do you become so good at it that your name becomes synonymous with public speaking, that your name becomes so entrenched in that skill that people know you for it like yourself? Well, again, practice and put yourself out there uh, over and over and over again. Uh, but you have to get good at it. People say, I want to be a public speaker. Well, what do you want to speak about? Oh, I don't know. Well, <laughs> we have enough parrots on earth already. They have feathers and they sit on perches. What we need from the new people is something new, some information presented in some specific way. So you need to decide what you're going to talk about. Being a public speaker isn't it. That's just a skill. Uh, 
a separate skill set and you have to have something to offer. So you line out what you're going to talk about and you bullet point it and you start diagramming it so that you have a set thing to run on. It may change uh, in any given presentation because something happened you didn't count on. In, in uh, London one day, there was a gentleman sitting in front of me, a group of stockholders in our Great Britain franchise. And he was had his hands up like this on top of a cane. And I saw him shutting his eyes from time to time. So I started, I shouldn't have, but I ignored about a thousand people in the room and started working with him because I thought if he topples over sound asleep, he, that's going to be a distraction. So I'm right down right. in his face, you know, and another thing, and you must <laughs> rise up and, you know, whatever. And he finally did topple over, but he wasn't asleep. He was dead. He died right in the middle of my talk. So that's where scripting, knowing what you're saying, comes in handy. I was in Atlanta one time, excuse me, I was called in Atlanta and asked to go to New York because the corporate team, and I wasn't part of it yet, the corporate team was coming to New York and William Penn Patrick, who I, he'd seen me work, wanted me to be the star of the show. And I was doing well. I was starting to win contests and so on. So I said, fine. Uh, and I learned my 47 minute script word for word, you know, every single laugh, gesture, everything uh, polished to perfection. And the gentleman introducing me was a guy named Ern Westmore. This first time I had appeared in front of 5,000 people, probably any group larger than 500, but there were 5,000 people in the grand ballroom of the Park Sheridan Hotel. I had lunch with Ern Westmore. He was the dean of Hollywood makeup artists. He was our vice president of beauty and fashion. And to assert to your mother uh, and or grandmother, she knew the Westmore family. There were five, a father and five brothers, and they were head of makeup at every major studio in Hollywood simultaneously. And because they had a tendency to drink and get fired, they had each been head of, of every studio in Hollywood individually. Earn had been the head of makeup, <laughs> and when he got fired, they'd bring his brother in. <laughs> you know, so but the Westmores dominated. So, and I grew up watching him on television. My mother thought he was, you know, God. So he's introducing me. I'm thinking, I can't believe this. Here I am, about your age, uh, addressing five thousand people, and I'm being introduced by Earn Westmore. Wow. Hopefully, I can remember my script. So he gets up, get, does his thing gives me a laudatory invitation, uh, in, uh, introduction and says, I had lunch with Ben today and I really believe he's going to really go places in this company, probably be president or something. I was saying, whoa, I hadn't thought of that. That's good. And he said, here he is, Benjamin, and I'm scared to death, 5,000 people. I'm, I'm used to talking in front of groups now, but not 5,000. It looked like an oil painting. It was sort of hard to believe. And uh, he says, and so here he is. And I'm thinking about running from the room and Benjamin and they swing the spotlight over on me. And I have my top, my foot on the bottom step about to go up onto the stage. So now I can't go anywhere. There's a spotlight on me. He says, Franklin Gay, the third and drops dead on stage in front of 5000 people. And, and and I don't mean fainted. I knew he had a heart problem. He told me that at lunch he was eating nitroglycerin tablets like they were M&Ms. Uh, but uh, uh, the way he went down, it, he was dead. I'm not a medical guy, but I could tell it from 50 feet away. So uh, I went up and is there a doctor in the house? And people came up and worked on him and what he called the whatever they were called in those days. They weren't EMTs yet, but the people with the stretcher came. And they were working on him. And one of them looked up at me and said, sir, he's dead. And I said, yes, I'd known that for 10 minutes. So they put him on the Stokes litter and they're heading for the door with him. And it's about to be back on me again. Uh, and I, it, I had a God help me. This wasn't on script. But uh, I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I had lunch with Ern Westmore today. And I asked him, seeing him eat pills. If you had to go, God forbid, how would you like to go? He said, I'd like to go on stage talking to women about how to be more beautiful. And I said, he got his wish. Let's give him one last standing ovation. And they almost tore the place down. 
screaming and yelling and pounding on, I guess, chairs. I remember sort of a drum beat and out Ern went and I remember the doors opening and then flap, 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 you know, behind him and he was gone. And people mumbled for a little while, but then they sat down and they looked at me and I thought, oh, I still have a meeting to give. What am I gonna do now? Script. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ben Gay. I'm a general distributor with Holiday Magic Cosmetics. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's very special meeting. Blah, 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 blah. 47 minutes later, they've watched the film. The light, it says, turn to the person who brought you here, ask them how you can get started. The lights came up and about half the room were prospects, half were distributors. So 12,000, uh, 2,500 people turned to the other 2,500 and started drawing circles and all. And usually an opportunity meeting, we close 40, 50% of the people in a group presentation like that. That night we closed 90%. Wow. So I've always said, if you've got a meeting to give and you're selling something, here's how to guarantee your success. Have a very famous person in, introduce you and drop dead on stage. Now, that's a problem because it's hard to get people to volunteer for that. But I'm telling <laughs> you, if, if a famous person introduces you, drop dead on stage and you know what to do next, you're home free. And that's really the key. You got to know what to do. I've had everything in the world happen to me. Can I tell you a couple of stories about disasters on stage? Please. That'd be all right. Okay. Uh, I'm driving down to Florida from uh, Atlanta with my business partner, Jimmy Rucker, James H. Rucker Jr., Bill Dempsey, the guy who got us in the business, and my sister-in-law, who was a, had become a top trainer with the company, a really beautiful girl. And uh, Dempsey was a great storyteller. And he begins to tell the story. Uh, there was an, a guy in Atlanta, downtown Atlanta, who sold newspapers. And why he didn't like to be called Henry, I don't know. Uh, who found out he didn't like to be called Henry, I don't know. But everybody of a certain age in Atlanta, meaning smart alecky teenagers, knew that if you drove past him and said, hey, Henry, he would go, Henry, 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 throw down his newspapers, stomp on them, and we'd drive away. We thought that was very funny. Looking back, I guess it wasn't, but we thought it was. Dempsey is telling me about walking down the street in that area of town with a friend of his, also in the company from Atlanta, Richard Michaels. And Richard was not from Atlanta and didn't know about this guy. So as they got up to him, Dempsey guided it where Richard would walk on one side, Dempsey would walk on the other. And when they got right beside him, Dempsey reached over on Richard's side, tapped Henry on the shoulder, who was facing away, and he said, hi, Henry. And Henry went off as predicted, Henry, 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 blankety blank, don't call me Henry, and hit Richard Michaels in the face with a stack of papers and dropped him. I don't know why, but I got hysterical here. I mean, you know, have you ever laughed to where you almost can't catch your breath, you know, and you, you laugh and you laugh and you laugh. I fell off the seat. I was in this big Lincoln Continental curled up under the dashboard in a fetal position, <laughs> laughing, laughing, laughing. Finally, we, we get we get to Orlando with me worn out from laughing for several hours. Uh, I'm supposed to go up on stage and I had a three ring binder with a couple of bullet points in it because I had to cover some things other than the script. And so I go up on stage. Here he is, Ben Gay, blah, 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 blah. And I open the book and there are A, no notes in it at all. Jimmy Rucker and Dempsey had taken my notes away just to be funny. And I look in the back of the room and Rucker has this roll of paper, like butcher paper, four feet tall. And he's unrolling it backing across the room. Dempsey's holding the other end. And it says in two foot tall letters, Henry, Henry, Henry. And I looked at it. And the next thing I knew, my knees had hit the floor of the stage. And then I curled up in a ball and I began shrieking, <laughs> laughing just like I'd done in the car, except now there's 500 people sitting there looking at me and they don't know what's going on. And as they, they finally came and got me up under the arms and dragged me face down, you know, facing the floor out. And I'm looking as I'm passing people in the aisle, I'm going, Henry, Henry, Henry. And they're sort of backing up like, you know, whatever <laughs> you have your own mental issues. Well, that made it funnier to me. And, uh, so I've collapsed on stage in uh, Los Angeles, 
uh, I had my briefcase up on the stage with me at the Palladium and I knelt down to get something out of it and split my pants from my underwear to the top of my shoes in both legs. It was mohair. <laughs> I guess they'd been pressed one too many times. So I'm standing in front of whatever, two, 3,000 people in my underwear. Uh, the uh, it, it, Time after time after time, funny things have happened, frequently brought on by the people I traveled with because we'd get bored. And so we would try and crack one another up. And the trick was to get so good you couldn't be cracked up. I promise you, Ben, there is nothing you can do to me that will make me break character, get off script now. Nothing. I've seen it all. I've done it. I've, I've collapsed on stage. I wound up naked virtually in front of thousands of people. I've been through it. And the way you get good enough is you do that type of thing over and over. By the way, before we run out of time, make sure that if you're watching or listening, you get this in your notes, record audio and video your presentation whenever you can. I don't care if you're just introducing somebody else, record it. You can, I teach public speaking. I do a course two or three times a year and you can come to one like that and we can do wonders with you, but nothing will work better than you sitting down, looking at a monitor and seeing yourself on stage because you will spot things that even I wouldn't spot because I don't know their aggravating little mannerisms or habits you have that you thought you'd gotten rid of. One time I was sitting in the train. I used to smoke three packs a day, cigarettes. And I was sitting in the training room, having just come back from New York. We had a big training room with a huge screen in it. And I just went up, as I always do, to watch my part of the presentation I had on my tailor-made black suit. And back then we smoked. The, if it was, you know, if you just got up and talked for 10 minutes, you probably didn't. But if you were up all day working and you were a smoker, you smoked. And at the tables, they all had a, a pitcher of water, several glasses, and ashtrays about every other thing, uh, every other seat. And I'm sitting there in the training room watching myself and how much time I was devoting to brushing ashes off my black suit and getting smoke out of my eyes because, you know, it would curl up and get in your eyes and looking for a place to put it out and so on. And I'm sitting there in the train room by myself watching this. I said, you look like an idiot, a total idiot. I took the pack of cigarettes in my shirt pocket, pulled it out, crushed it, threw it in a nearby trash can. And that was it. Three packs a day since I was 16 to then when I was probably in my early 30s, never touched a cigarette again, never had any interest in it and all. And it was all based on watching, watching a speech to see how I looked. And it not only became a health benefit, it made me knock off something that must have been terribly annoying to the audiences, but nobody ever said anything to me. And they won't probably come up and say, by the way, the way you walk from here to here, you look like a kangaroo. That's stupid. But if you see it, you'll correct it that quick. So watch yourself uh, and then get around groups that can help you. Toastmasters is sort of like Arthur Murray Dance Studios. I don't know if you're old enough to remember them. I think they're still around. But if you see Arthur Murray graduates, they all dance exactly the same. I've been in a, a nightclub once where they had a, I call it a nest of Arthur Murray people had arrived to socialize. They weren't there to perform. But I was watching them and they'd all been to the same classes and whatever the music was, they all turned their head at exactly the same time. It looked like the Rockettes. And I thought, oh, that's a shame. They didn't learn how to dance naturally. They learned how to dance like Arthur Murray and his wife danced 80 years ago. Toastmasters, if you're not careful, tends to do that. You get up in front of the room and hello, and I cannot say ah because we have an ah master, and he will count the number of times I say ah, and I will now look sincere by walking over here and so on. But what Toastmasters really does, and I've run a couple over the years, uh, what Toastmasters really does is it gets you over the fear of speaking in public. You talked about earlier the fear. Uh, an old friend of mine, a human behavioral psychologist named Wade Cannon, told me that he had read a study. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not. We speakers tend to make up studies whenever we need one and, and percentages. But I think Wade was well schooled enough where I suspect he actually read it, that public speaking was the number one psychological fear ahead of death by fire. Now, to me, I remember being 
nervous and all, but I wanted the attention so much that I broke through it. I didn't have to go to therapy or join a club. I broke through it. And then giving the, this, I've given, I estimate over 5,000 paid appearances now to about two and a half million people. I used to do 300 seminars a year until I met Gigi who knew my previous two wives, good friends, all three of them were good friends. And they told her among the things that broke up the marriage was I was never there. I was on the road all the time. So I've cut way back. Gigi and I came to a, a, an agreement, no more than 24 speeches a year, no speeches within 50 miles of home. So I'm, when I go out, I'm not on stage. I don't have to, you know, put on a suit and tie and be Mr. Gay here in town, in the little town of Placerville, California. I'm Gigi Ronzoni's husband, and we don't know what he does. I have no local clients, no speeches within 50 miles of home, and I'm around. Most people don't even know I travel. If you've only gone 24 times a year, you're around most of the time. Uh, so that's how I cut it back. But before I cut it way back and continuing now, Roughly 5,000 plus paid speeches, roughly 500 people per audience would be an average. I've talked to 15,000, 20,000, 5,000, dozens and dozens of times, but I guess it all averages down about 500. So it's two and a half million people uh, that I've been up in front of. So after that, you're, I mean, and you don't have to do that many. I years ago got through that little concern, but I am more comfortable now on stage in front of 5,000 people than I am at Thanksgiving dinner doing small talk with 20 or 30 of Gigi's relatives in the living room. I, you know, I, I think sometimes get me out of here, get me to a hotel ballroom, <laughs> let, let me do my thing. And that will come for your folks if they get up and start. That's like all motivational speakers tell you and inspirational people, no matter what your goal is, the first thing to do is start. Print the cards, grit your teeth, get up in front of the Kiwanis Club or the Lions Club or the whatever. Be the go-to guy. We have a, a gentleman here in town who uh, is the MC at everything. I don't care. He just did the Christmas parade. Before that, he did the Thanksgiving, whatever. They have an Oktoberfest where they, you know, block off the street type thing and somebody's up with a microphone. It's always him in the newspaper. Someone's receiving an award. There he is handing the plaque over. He's he's at every place. He obviously loves it, but that's how he's gotten good. I've heard him work a few times and he's as good as any professional speaker I've ever heard. Yes, he just didn't have that particular goal in mind. But the, but the way he did it, I know I've never talked to him about it, but the way he did it was he got up and he got up and he got up and he got up and he got better and he got better and he got better. And if he was asking for money, I assume he does those for free. I don't know. If he were asking for money, his fee would have gone up. Mine started for free, 300. Well, I wonder if they'll pay 500. Remember the first time I asked for 1500, that was shocking. Uh, and then the other little thing I do, this may be getting ahead of the, putting the horse and the cart in front of the horse a little bit. I saw Zig one time with this, I wasn't speaking at this event, he was. And I saw him with this sort of look in his face like you don't ever want to see on somebody you admire. He was sort of semi panic. He was looking for the program chairman because he had a plane to catch and they hadn't handed him his check yet and he'd already given his talk. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't want to ever be in that position. So whatever my fee was at that time, it became, you pay it now uh, before I go on. And because that's a little awkward, you know, I'm not going to go on if you don't give me my check, uh, because that's a little awkward. I backed it off. And if you want to hire me to do a seminar, we will reserve a date with a $500 deposit if the date's more than 30 days away, $500 deposit, which is not refundable, but it is transferable. Things happen. So you got 500 down on whatever talk, whenever. And then the balance of it, including the plane tickets and all, are due 30 days before the event. I've never, to my knowledge, lost an uh, engagement over that. Although some people said in advance, you know, what if you die? And I said, well, here's the good news. I will sometime. The odd of it being on the day of your event is pretty slim. Uh, and uh, I've given over 5,000 paid appearances. I've never missed one nor been late to one. 
And I'm really proud of that record. So you won't be the first. It's also the reason I fly in the day before. I'm not skidding into the airport 30 months before I'm supposed to be on stage. I fly in the day before. And most of the time I stay uh, till the next morning to leave because I don't want to be on stage glancing at my watch trying to figure out if I've got to get out of there to get to a plane. And I make more money off stage than I do on stage. Here's a little tip for your folks. As soon as you have something worthy to say, start writing it down, taking notes, have a book. A book is the greatest business card in the world. Here's the closers. Uh, well, there's part two, but it doesn't make any difference. Uh, the closers. I have two part twos here. I was hoping to pull up a part one. Uh, closers part two is a business card. We sell it for $24.95, but it's a business card. It's the easiest way to get credibility. You know, how do I know you know what you're talking about? Well, I've been at it long enough where I don't get that question anymore, but I did for a while and I handed them a book and I said, well, I've written a book about it. And, and you know, maybe we should just buy the book. And I said, no, I, among the first things I will say when I get on stage, it's again, like the Ben Gay line, uh, I will say, uh, they didn't pay me $10,000 to come here and have me read you a $24 book. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to teach you the things that aren't in the book, but the book is available right at the back of the room. I'll sign them and date them for you uh, at our website, bfg3.com. Then I give them a place on eBay where it's always on special because someone I know steals inventory out of our warehouse and puts it up on special. That person is Gigi, my wife. People say, how can she sell cheaper than you? I said, I have to pay for my books. She doesn't pay for her. She steals them. So <laughs> she has a place on eBay where she does that. But write a book. I'll give, it, I'll give you a, a example, a recent example. I was given a seminar in Atlanta. I was paid 9500 to give the seminar. And, and this is not untypical, but it's recent and a good example. I go back at the uh, uh, at a break, I took a break for lunch, I think it was. I go back and I walk out in the little area where they had the booth set up and there's Gigi. She was running the booth that day. And I said, how do we do? How are we doing? If she had said, we haven't sold anything yet, I wouldn't have been surprised or disappointed because I hadn't finished yet. I hadn't done the altar call yet. They knew it was out there. They probably saw it when they came in, uh, but I hadn't done that yet. And I said, I said, so how are we doing? She said, I think pretty good. We've sold $96,000 worth of material so far. This is lunch, 9,500 in front of the room, 96,000, I think it was, at the back of the room by lunchtime. So as you get serious about your speaking career, and today self-publishing is so easy. I was 25 years old before I met anyone who'd ever written a book. It was Dr. Napoleon Hill and I'd Think and Grow Rich. And when he came into my office and went to work for me, we shook hands. And I thought, God, I'm shaking hands with Napoleon Hill. He's written a book. Only person I knew. Now I don't know anybody that hasn't written a book. I have piled around me. I'm sort of glad the camera can't see it. I'll bet you there are a hundred books within arm's length of me on the floor, on my desk here, a hundred books written by people I know and love and so on. And they're all bestsellers somewhere at Amazon or somewhere. I don't know what bestseller means nowadays, but I got a lot of free bestsellers <laughs> grouped around me. But what they really are for the people is it gives credibility and it gives something to sell at the back of the room. And it gives them a reason to hang around and become buddies. Once you start speaking on a regular basis, the, the, besides the 96,000, the 9,500 and so on. And by the way, a lot of my friends charge more than I do for speaking. I just found I sort of felt, well, that's enough. You know, I used to, it was, used to be 9,500 and I paid my own airfare and hotel. So my little price rise is I don't do that anymore. They pay my airfare and hotel plus 9,500, but I think I'm pretty much done raising the price. I remember when I was mowing lawns, so I, I, I don't feel like I deserve 9,500 for chatting with people, uh, but they're willing to pay it and I'm willing to take it. But when you have that thing at the back of the room, it gives you credibility, greatly increases your income, gives you more time to sit around and talk with them and become their friends. Some of my very best friends on earth first hired me to do an event or were at the event and we became buddies.
Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to make friends and public speaking gives you the opportunity to make lots of friends. That's amazing. That's amazing. Fire so, away. so, you know, I, I want to, I want to start wrapping up pretty soon. Um, I think we've delivered an extreme amount of value and I, I really Good. do appreciate your time. Um, but I want to cover one more thing. I want to cover the close. I want to cover at the, at the end of your at the end of your speech, at the end of, of your talk, at the end of your presentation. How do you engage with the audience at such a level and inspire them to take the next step with you? How do you close at the very, very end when it's crunch time? I'm glad you phrased it that way because you led me into the perfect answer. I close, I start closing when I say, let's get this Ben Gay thing out of the way. I'm closing for either the hour or the eight hours of the half day or whatever it is. I'm closing all the time because I'm building my credibility. When I teach closing, and it, it, this ties into exactly what you said, but I want to give you a one-on-one -on -one example. When I teach how to close a sale, uh, I, te I teach a thing. It's the last chapter in the closers part two. It's called sales infiltration. It starts on page 257. It is the finest thing ever written about selling, in spite of the fact I wrote it, uh, but it's true, the best thing. And the close that I use, and my closing rate, by the way, is 86% roughly. I wasn't keep, keeping records day one, but over time and keeping records, I close about 86% of the people that I ask to buy. Now, that's the good news, but I figured it up the other day with the number of presentations I've given. Uh, people say, you know, how do you fit? And I'm not talking about group closes, 15,000. I'm talking about one on one, Ben Gay and the prospect. Uh, I've given just shy of 100,000 sales presentations, 86% closing rate. People go, oh my God, that's amazing. I said, well, it is until you realize that uh, I forget exactly what the math is. I have it written down somewhere. That means that third, I'll make up a number, 30,000 people listened to my entire presentation and said, no, thank you. So, you know, how do you get over the nose? I said, well, I, the first one was hard, but after there's been 30,000 of them, you sort of work your way through it. My sales presentation one-on-one -on -one and in front of the audience is to build credibility, build credibility, do what I call sales infiltration. It is the most sophisticated and frankly, simple method of selling there is. And what I'm trying to do in that presentation is get into a position to say, because once I have the right to say it, odds are you're going to buy. To get into a position to be able to righteously say, Ben, based on what we've discussed or based on what you've told me, you know, it depends on the, the way the conversa conversation went, but that's about the only variable. Based on what you've told me, here's what I suggest we do. We do. Because see, it's not Ben Gay versus you, Ben as the enemy, we have formed a new team. It's not team, team A plus team against team B. We have a new team. It's called team C and Ben and Ben are looking for a solution together. So Ben, it's, it's a little awkward to do this since we're both named Ben, but Ben, based on what you've told me, here's what I suggest we do. Blah, blah, blah buy the car, buy the vacuum cleaner, get the hearing aids, buy the land in Arizona, whatever. Here's what I suggest we do. Pause. Fair enough. And 86% of the time they say, yeah, yeah. Or they might have an additional question, you know, but it's hard to say no to fair enough. So that's the magic close that I use 100% of the time and get 86% closing rate with you. So in front of a big group, uh, I'll try and get the right books this time. In front of a big group, uh, I say, people come up to me all the time and say, Mr. Gay, I would give anything in the world. Um, let's say I'm in front of 5,000 folks. The, that day with 96,000, by the way, was in front of 2,500 dentists who wanted to learn how to build their practice. I say, people come up to me all the time and they say, I would give anything in the world to know what you know about selling. I say, good news. It's just $65.95. You get the closers part one, you get the closers part two, 
and you get Sales Closing Power, the book I wrote for J. Douglas Edwards after he died, but it's from his seminar material, so it's true to it. Everything I know, except for nuances and subtleties that can't be written down, you know, the old thing about you can't read a book about how to ride a bicycle, you got to do it. Uh, it. Everything I know that can be written down is in these three books and at eBay, it, it uh, runs Zony Books, Gigi's theft site. Uh, they're all available for $65.95. So, you know, or they're all available at the back of the room, and then we have a bigger package with audios in it and so on, so for $5.95 or whatever. But, you know, here's what you ought to do. Based on what we've discussed here today, at breaks, the indications you gave me from the audience, blah, 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 I'm just twisting that same thing that I would do one-on-one -on -one around. Based on that, here's what I suggest we do. Go to the back of the room. Uh, you'll meet Gigi and some assistants back there, wonderful people, and get the at least the three books, at least. And then I'll be over here, bring them over here, and I'll sign them and date them for you. And they flock to the back of the room. But that's not based on, hi, I don't know what I'm doing, da 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 da, da but I got some books in the back. You got to earn the right to say, Ben, based on what we've discussed, Here's what I suggest we do. Fair enough. That's the one-on-one -on -one close that I use all the time. It's the ending of most seminars that I do uh, all the time. And there can be in a big group, there can be slight variables, but not many. I'm not trying to sell you an item. I'm trying to get in position to rightfully say, based on what we discussed, what I suggest we do, and expect a positive answer. People say, well, I don't you know. I don't get an 86% closing rate. And I say, well, you're not as good as I am. But the other thing they don't understand is I don't pull the trigger until I know where they are in the cycle. In other words, I don't just go in and fire away and here's what you ought to buy. I maneuver, maneuver, maneuver. And when they're ready to buy, I feel an atmospheric pressure change in the room or even over the phone. I do a lot of selling by phone. Uh, I feel an atmospheric pressure change. And if I, I still write orders down, I don't sit at the computer and do them because I'm over at my other desk over there writing. Uh, I start writing your name and, and all the information I already know about you before you agree to buy, because I know you're going to buy. I felt the atmospheric pressure change. I felt you sort of go, okay, I'm going to do it. And when I say fair enough, just about everybody says yes. You also have to have the courage to ask for the order. Most people don't ask for the order. Um, I got one random tip I'd like to give you. I can see in my notes here because I, I made some bullet points. Uh, in addition to Toastmasters, see if you have a local chapter of the National Speakers Association in your area. You don't need to join and fly to Arizona every few minutes and spend thousands of dollars. But the National Speakers Association is a group of people a cut above Toastmaster experience. I would get in with them. I was one of the first 12 members of the National Speakers Association. Cute story, Cabot Robert, who is the, the founder, the chairman emeritus, the late great Cabot Robert, great speaker. And Wade Cannon, I mentioned him earlier, human behavioral psychologist, called me from an airport bar somewhere. It was obvious they'd had a couple. And Ben, we got a great idea. And I said, what is it? We're going to form the National Speakers Association and all of us, back then there were probably 20 of us making a living doing it, all of us are going to be in it and we're each going to put up $50 today, that would be about 500 so it was enough to go, well, tell me more and said, I'll just send it to you. Each put up $50 and Cabot, who is an attorney, will do the, his contribution is setting up the, the legal framework to form the association, which he did and that's where we started, 12 people originally from two to, I tell people next time you see two bar two drunks in a bar writing on a cocktail napkin don't laugh at them they may be on the verge <laughs> of a big breakthrough which is how NSA started but but get get around other people who are already doing it you know if I if I join a sales organization or I'm consulting with them and I'm going to go on the floor or whatever first thing I want to know is who's your top person 
and I want to study him for a while. If I was really new to selling, I'd, I'd make a nuisance of myself and I'd shower him forever. Now I probably need about 40 minutes, an hour, just to sort of see how the games play. Get around people who are already speaking. People call me and say, should I go to the so-and-so seminar? I say, yes. And they say, well, I didn't tell you what it was about or how much it costs. I said, it doesn't make any difference. If you can afford it, it doesn't make any difference because you're going to get around like-minded people some of whom know a lot more about the subject matter than you do. So yes, go to the seminar. Don't be the one at the back sitting near the bathroom trying planning his escape. Sit in the front row with a notepad and make notes, positive and negative, about everything you see on the stage and come away a better speaker. A lot of what I know about speaking came from those early days with Wade Cannon, Zig Ziglar, J. Douglas Edwards, Earl Nightingale, who was a horrible public speaker, by the way. He hated it. He grabbed the lectern and just looked straight ahead and talked, but they wanted to hear him because he was Earl Nightingale. Uh, and Napoleon Hill wasn't a great speaker either, but he earned his bones through uh, Think and Grow Rich. But you study those people, what to do, what not to do. And then you study your own tapes, what to do, what not to do, what to do more of, what to take out of the act. And it's a pretty simple thing, but get started. The key is, it's like somebody said to me this morning, uh, how would you, how would I get my book published? If I he said I said have you written it yet? And he said no. And I said well <laughs> let's have this conversation after you've written your book. It's a waste of my time to do it now. You've got to get started. I have the magic phone numbers. I call it my magic Rolodex. It's right over on that desk. It's a real old fashioned Rolodex. I flip through it. I'm two phone calls away from just about anyone on earth. If I don't know who it is, the person I call does know who it is. I will go to the magic Rolodex and I will tell you who will get your book published, promoted, move forward, da, 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 da. after you write it. I'm not going to waste their time, my time, or even your time should be spent writing now. So if you want to be a public speaker, Tell me about it after you've been on stage four or five times. I don't care if you die, you'll learn from it. Get up, get started, give the talk. And then I will give you a tip Zig Ziglar gave me when I was starting to, I was as big a deal as he was, bigger in the company, but it getting to be a big deal. And I said, Zig, you've been at this longer than I have. Give me some advice. He said, Ben, never pass up a chance to sit down or go to the bathroom. <laughs> and of all the advice that <laughs> gave me over the years, those are probably two of the most profound that he ever did. Because I, when I'm talking to people who are going from point A to point B, I'm looking for the men's room and I'm looking for a place to, if I can gracefully sit, a tall stool's great. Because you're standing there on your feet for hours at a time. I don't know about you, but my, but you're young. My back locks up. So I never pass up a chance to go to the bathroom or sit down. And that's from Zig, directly from the horse's mouth, directly from Zig Ziglar. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, Ben, I, I do want to thank you so much for coming on and doing this workshop today. Uh, I think we've provided some serious, serious value. You provided some incredible value. So I want to thank you for that. Um, so, I, you know, I, I do want to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much for everybody who has attended and who's, who's listening to this. Uh, ben, can, can you close it on out for us? What, what's the next step? What do we do moving forward and, and uh, take, take us home? Well, if you want to learn how to sell at the risk of being terribly commercial, go to stores, S-T-O-R-E-S, -E like a store with an S on the end, stores.ebay.com slash Ronzoni Books, R-O-N-Z-O-N-E Books, B-O-O-K-S, all one word, stores.ebay.com slash Ronzoni Books. Get the three book set because you got to learn how to sell. Wanting to speak doesn't mean anything if you can't talk to somebody into paying you to do it. Um, it it's not, it's easier for me now but it, what you know, adjusted for inflation, all it's never been easy to have somebody call you frequently who's never doesn't know you. They've only heard of you by reputation and talk them into sending you ninety five hundred dollars plus airfare, first class. Thank you very much. Uh, first class airfare and a nice hotel room for two nights uh, over the phone. And then they send it to you. And I if they want to write up a little contract fine but i don't i don't have a contract it's just word of mouth handshake over the phone or occasionally handshake uh 
uh, in front of them and uh, with them. And that's not an easy, easy sale, but it is for me because I know what's in the three books. I not only wrote it, uh, I've learned it, memorized it, marked them up, highlighted it. And I, then I hardly do anything that isn't scripted when, uh, and I can't help it. Gigi and I laugh about it. Last night we went out to dinner and I said, your choices are, and I gave her three restaurants choices. <laughs> she can go anywhere she wants, but it's easier for her. I gave her three restaurants within, within four or five miles of the house. And I said, which one uh, would you like to go to? And she says, oh, the choice clothes. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> based on what we've discussed, Ben, I think I'd like to go to the public house. It's just a little, just a little pub here in town, you know. And then uh, as we go through the menu, I usually order for her. I talk to her, but I order for her and so on. It, it's just, she said, she kids me. She said, can you ever stop with the scripting? I said, I, the non-script Ben Gay is gone. That all that's left is Ben Gay, who's figured out the effective ways to say certain things. Quick one, I know we're running out of time. I formed the 800 call center industry. That's my creation. Thank you very much. The National Communication Center. I started 1976 when 95% of all Americans did not know that an 800 number was toll free. They used to call and yell because they thought it was long distance and talk fast because they thought they were paying for it. We had to educate the population while we were creating an industry, while I was starting a business from scratch. And uh, so one day it built up, built up, built up. Finally, we have 150 operators. We're taking 50, 60,000 calls a day. Uh, everything on script, you call and ask for operator 120. This is before computers like this were everywhere. They had a big book in front of them, like a Sears catalog. They turned up operator 120 and said, this is operator 120 with so-and-so and blah, 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 and answer questions, scripted, 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 and take orders or messages or what have you. But I was sitting in the control room one day just listening, and I heard people, uh, they would they call in to get their messages. Now, this is a business person on the road, probably dead tired, doesn't want any more bad news, wishes he, was, he or she was home, and so on. And they call in for messages, and they say, no, you don't have any messages. And I, I listened to it about 20 times in a short period of time. I said, my God, this clown is in an airport in Cleveland, beaten down and somebody friendly, but somebody says, no, you don't have any messages. And I said, that's gotta be horrible. And we had an attrition rate higher than we should have had. So went up to my office, sat there for a minute with a legal pad, came back down said, put them on hold, put every call on hold. I said, next time somebody says they don't uh, calls for their messages or orders or whatever, you were to say, assuming it's a man, we had both, but you're to say, you're all clear, sir. Like it was good news. No one on the planet decided to call you because you're a loser and you're in Cleveland. But to us, that's good news. You're all clear, sir. And our attrition rate went from about 20% to 2% almost overnight. It's how you say, Cabot Robert once said to a, to a group, I got the biggest kick it out. He, we were talking about the ability to communicate and so on. And he said, Ben Gay is so positive. He can tell you to go to hell and have you looking forward to the trip. And so <laughs> I used that little uh, tidbit from time to time, realizing that just, just the twist of a phrase, just to, you're all clear, sir, solved a huge business problem, probably made us a million dollars a year versus the way we were doing it. Uh, so always look for a way, if you got to tell them to go to hell, look for a way to have them look forward to the trip. And if you're going to be a speaker, you're going to be a salesperson. Whether you like it or not, you're a salesperson. Most speakers were salespeople anyway. That's how they get into selling. But for those who maybe have some other area of interest, they're going to be talking about the answer is the same. You got to learn how to sell. Closers part one, closers part two, sales closing power, all available on eBay at special pricing is it. And so when you say, I'll give anything in the world to know everything you know about selling, good news is it's $65.95. I'm calling your bluff. That's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, again, if you look down below, I'm going to include links to all of these amazing resources for you. Um, again, Ben, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Um, 
it, it has truly been a pleasure to, to speak with you and to um, you know have you share so many amazing tips with the audience and to, to everybody who's listening. Thank you so much. Y'all are the reason that we do this. I love you very much. And let's build a better world together. Take care.